Welcome to Grace Community Church. My name is Jason, one of the pastors here at Grace. Specifically, I'm one of the pastors at our downtown Iowa City location. We are one church in two locations here in North Liberty. And then on Sunday evenings, we meet downtown Iowa City, right there on the campus at the University of Iowa. We want to welcome you for being here with us this morning, for choosing to worship our Creator with us. If you're here for the first time, or if you'd like to get more plugged into Grace Community Church, we'd like to ask a favor of you. In the seat back in front of you, there's a welcome card. If you could grab that and just give us your information and indicate anything that you'd like information about, we would love to get you connected to the information, the resources, or the relationships that would be beneficial to you. So you can fill that out and drop it in the basket at the back as you exit here this morning. This morning we're finishing up our series called Compass, Where We Go From Here. We think about a compass, a compass is something that tells us which direction is which. And so we've been looking at God's word to see, as a church, what God would have for us. Both trying to determine where we are, but where he would like us to go as well. Before we jump into that, I I need to just make a statement of clarification here. If you were here last week, you heard from Pastor Steve Shepherdly. He's my co-pastor at the downtown Iowa City location. And he um, may have mentioned to you that he's from Missouri. Um, I'm also from Missouri, but that begs a clarification that I'd like to make for you. Um, So when you think of Pastor Steve, (laughs) make sure you picture the right Missouri. This is the Missouri that Pastor Steve comes from. And this is the Kansas City, in Kansas City, the Missouri that I come from. Um, Again, a little different. And so it begs the question, is this Missouri? No, this is Missouri. So, just so we have that clear, we we need to make sure we clarify that for folks. Again, when we think about a compass, a compass is helpful because it tells us which direction is which. But as we close this series, I'd like to talk about the fact that a compass is only helpful if you know where you're going. It doesn't help you at all to know which direction is north if you don't know where you're going or if you don't know where you are. I prefer to go on a hike without a compass, just to wander, to be an explorer. Um, My wife and my oldest child, they need a map and they need a compass. So whether it's in the woods or the state fair or um, at the zoo, they want a map. They want to know where they're going. They want to know where they are. Whereas I just kind of like to wander. Wandering might be fun, but when we're talking about what does God's word say about our church and who we are as a church, we better know where we're going. We better know what the objective is. And so that's what our objective is this morning, is to determine for this whole series and really for our church, where are we headed? Where does God want us to go in the future? We've been taking a look at three gospel initiatives, gospel truth, gospel community, and gospel mission. Again, we're not using the word gospel as a modifier just because we find ourselves in a church setting. We're using the word gospel because we're talking about a certain kind of truth, a certain kind of community, a certain kind of mission. Gospel truth means that we are committed to the truth of Scripture and believe that the central message of Scripture is the gospel, the message of God's gracious work to redeem sinners. As we read gospel truth, as his spirit imparts gospel truth to us through his word, it brings us together in a gospel community, a community of people committed to knowing, loving, and serving one another as brothers and sisters united in Christ, a group of people that doesn't just see each other on Sunday mornings or Sunday nights as they come together as a corporate gathering, but a community within a community. A community of people coming and seeing God's love in gospel truth and then sharing that love in the context of spiritual community. And then we go out on gospel mission, which is being that community of believers within our larger community. And as we do gospel mission, we declare and demonstrate the gospel to our communities, our cities, and to the nations. This morning in particular, we're talking about taking that gospel mission to the nations, this nation included. What does it look like when a group of people really believes gospel truth, really lives in gospel community, and then goes out on mission? What does it look like to demonstrate and declare the gospel everywhere that we go? That's our task this morning. Would you pray with me? Would you pray for me as well? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have to um, dig into your word. 
God, we want it to be our compass that tells us where we are and where we are going. God, we want to walk according to your ways. We want to know, believe, and share the gospel with the world. God, help us to believe your gospel. Help us to believe the good news. Help us to see how we can be redeemed and how we can be those that go to reconcile others to their God. Father, give us ears to hear. Give us minds to understand. Give us hearts to believe. Give us hands and feet ready to do your will and do your work and declare and demonstrate the gospel. In Christ's name, amen. We all desire purpose in our lives, and we desire purpose as a church as well. We want to know why should we do what we are doing? And that's the fundamental question that I'd like to ask this morning. Why are we doing what we're doing? What's the aim of what we are doing as a church? What is the aim of calling ourselves a believer? What does it mean to be a Christian? That's what we're talking about today. In life, we are all looking for purpose. Even people that do not consider themselves believers or do not even believe in God, they're looking for a purpose. We look at the world around us or we feel innately inside of us that we're made for something more than what we are experiencing. So we try to find meaning, we try to find purpose and define it, and largely we try to define it for ourselves in the culture and the time and place we find ourselves in. So we're constantly looking for what is the purpose of all of this. Many scientists look to the skies and they look for some law, some order that brings purpose to the universe. And as they see the complexity of the world, they think, if there is a God who has made a world this complex, surely we can't know him. And so they're led to believe that there must not be a God, that it must be the laws of physics, the laws of biology that is holding all things together. but they and we continue to look for purpose. It's hard for us to believe a God that is that beautiful and to think that he would want to have anything to do with us. Or we look around at our world and our lives and we think there can't be a loving God because of what I've experienced and what I see in our world. So we struggle to understand what is our purpose? What am I made for? Where am I supposed to be? The astrophysicist Carl Sagan says, we began as wanderers on this planet and wander we still do today. And he goes on to say in that same paragraph that for him, the meaning of life and changing from a wanderer to someone that has purpose is, he says, but maybe, just maybe we can reach the stars someday. Maybe we can live among the stars. That is his sense of purpose. That is his sense of hope. And my question is, is that all there is? Is this all there is? What we find ourselves in the middle of today in our lives. I find myself wandering through life way too often. Wondering, is this it? Is this what life is about? And I think if you're honest, you find yourself asking the same question, feeling like a wanderer. What's the point to all of this? What's the point of Life, what's the point of my job? What's the point of family? What's the point of church? What's the point of all of this? And we're not coming up with a lot of answers. We are entertaining ourselves to death because we can't bear to sit in the quiet and think about where our life is headed. As I minister and as I counsel and as I disciple, especially millennials, young people, I see this overwhelming anxiety where they have to have something going on. They have to have media. They ha have to have social media. They have to have something going on. We can't sit still and think because we'll be overwhelmed with the question, what's it all about? What is the purpose of my life? Why am I in college? Why am I working this job that's a dead end? Where, where do I find myself? Where am I headed? It's a fundamental part of our experience. And we're haunted by that question of what is my purpose? 
We're haunted by the question of where is home for me? We find this dissatisfaction in everything we experience in life. It may satisfy for a moment or it may satisfy for a night, but in the end, the next morning, we wake up and we're still wandering on this earth. I'm reading a book by Marilyn Robinson. She's a retired professor at the uh, Iowa Writers Workshop. And in her book, Home, she tells the story of a patriarch of a family who is growing old and his youngest daughter, Glory, comes back to live and take care of her father. So she's there waiting on him hand and foot. And after 20 years, an estranged brother who no one has spoke to for 20 years comes back to the family home. And she finds herself waiting on him too. So she finds herself acting as a servant in the house she grew up in, serving her father, serving her brother. And she's embarrassed by this. And this is what she says in the book. What an embarrassment that was, being somewhere because there was nowhere else for me to be. This is far too often how we feel. I'm here because I don't have anywhere else to be. I don't have another job to be in. I don't have another family or thing to be in. And so we just numb ourselves and keep our minds busy so we don't have to think about that fact. Or we change all of those things. We try to get a new family, a new job, a new house, and it still doesn't satisfy. C.S. Lewis says that if we find that nothing in this life can satisfy us, if nothing in this world can satisfy us, that we must be made for a different world. We must be made for something else. There must be a purpose outside of what we see in this world. So what is that purpose? I'd like to submit to you this morning that that purpose, the clicker isn't working. If you could help me out, thank you. The purpose in this life is having a relationship with our creator. We're going to go very quickly through a number of scriptures here. We're going to go pretty quick um, because I really want to get to the application and talk about where we're headed as a church, what the purpose behind all of this is. But I want to go through a number of scriptures here to show you that this is not just something that Grace Community Church has cooked up. It's not a niche thing or a season of ministry or a fad or we read some book about. This is all over scripture. What we're submitting to you as the elders and leaders of Grace Community Church, what we're setting forth as this is where we're headed as a church, it comes straight out of God's word and what we're looking to do comes from him. So in Genesis, we're going to talk about the dwelling place of God. Our purpose in life can only be found in relationship with our God, with our creator. And we, down deep inside, we know that our relationship with him is not what it is meant to be. And that's because it's not what it's meant to be. If we look back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis, we see man walking with God. We see man in relationship, perfect relationship with God and in perfect relationship with one another. We see Adam and Eve made in the image of God, experiencing perfect relationship. That's what we are intended to have. And that other world that we're created for that C.S. Lewis is talking about, he's talking about this world where we're walking in perfect fellowship with God and with one another. But there's a problem. The problem is found in Genesis chapter 3 where we see Adam and Eve be their own boss. They try to determine their own meaning, their own destiny, apart from their creator. They try to define what love is apart from their creator. In Genesis 3.8, it says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Man and woman hear God's voice and it is no longer pleasant to them. It brings shame. So they hide, they keep themselves busy because there's a break in their relationship with God and with one another. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1. We read the the story of the Tower of Babel. 
starting in verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people. They have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over all the face of the earth and they left off building the city. We see people coming together. And what does it say they are setting out to do? Let us make a name for ourselves. That is at the heart of our sin and our wandering. We are trying to make a name for ourselves. We are trying to make a name for our church. And it's not working. Or we think it's working, which is maybe even worse. So we set out to make a name for ourselves, make a name for our church, But God comes and he scatters his people. Because making a great city with one language and making a name for themselves was not his plan. Take note of this part that says, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. We'll go back to that. So, we're broken in our relationship with one another and with our God. But we're given from the very beginning the promise of home. In Deuteronomy 33, we're going to go through a few verses here very quickly. I'll have you turn to one of them. But in Deuteronomy 33, it says, The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Our dwelling place is under the protection of our God. Psalm 46 says, There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The dwelling place of God brings life to all. That's what we're reading here. In Psalm 48, God is described as a fortress that we run into when we take our refuge in. Ezekiel 37 says, My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel, when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place will be with them. I will send my spirit to live in them. And then in the New Testament, we read in Acts 17 that he has set the exact times and places where we should live. He gives us life and breath and everything. He has set the exact times and places where we should live so that we would reach out and find our creator. And then turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 17. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We are a building, his church being built up, each member doing its part, so that we would be a dwelling place for his Spirit, built on the cornerstone of Jesus. The Spirit of God coming to dwell in his people. This building is not a church. It's a barn that the church meets in. The Spirit of God living inside of us is the church. 
The church are his redeemed people coming together, being a gospel community, and taking the gospel out to our community. That's church. This is the church gathering together for large group teaching and worship. This is not church. God's spirit doesn't live here in this building. God's spirit lives in the redeemed, his church, the people who he has bought for himself. That's the dwelling place of God. It's amazing that God would love me and save me, but it is astounding that he would live inside of this broken and sinful and dirty vessel. It's built on the power of the gospel. And then in Revelation 7, we read this. He who sits on the throne, this is at the end of all times, will shelter them with his presence and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. We will be reunited with our Savior. We will be reunited with our Creator and we will dwell with him forever. In Revelation 5, you can follow along here on the screen. I'd like to look at the first four verses of Revelation 5, where we see this culmination of of history, God's people brought together. Then I saw in the hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. This is at the culmination of history. The people from every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered together. And commentators disagree to some extent on what is the contents of this scroll, what is written on the front and the back of this scroll, but they all agree that in some way it is the summation of the history and the future of the universe, the meaning of the universe. And the people of God are brought together and they say, no one is worthy to read the scroll. No one is worthy to break this open and see what the purpose of all of history and all of the future is. We see this on a cosmic level. We see this on a personal level. We see this in the world as we see it today. Our world is in chaos. Our world is a mess. It is easy for you and I to not realize how big of a mess our world is in. We have a complicated political situation going on in our country. I think that's an understatement. But we have no idea what it's like for some people in this world right now. In Psalm 2, we read, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together to be against the Lord and his anointed. That is for all time. The nations are raging. People are raging. We are numbing ourselves to death because we can't figure out what the purpose of life is. And we are adopting all kinds of purposes and all kinds of meanings that have nothing to do with God's purposes and meanings. So we're in chaos. Our world has a problem. Our nation has a problem. Our homes have a problem. Our church has a problem. We need to remember what our purpose is. We need to remember that our purpose is to be at home with God, to have relationship with him. There are people in this world who have no literal place to lay their head. If you watched the opening ceremony of the Olympics this year, you saw all the countries coming in, following their flag, their, the flag representing their nation. They interviewed one three Olympic gold medalist who said this was a greater honor, carrying her country's flag was a greater honor than winning those gold medals. Everyone walks in and pride for their country. But for the first time ever, there was a group of people walking by a flag that did not represent any nation. That flag that they carried in was the Olympic flag. And they were known as the refugees. 
the people with no nation to call their own, no place to lay their head. There are people in this world that do not experience a place to lay their head. There are people in our community that do not have a place to lay their head. Outside of that, there are many in this world that have no spiritual home. They are estranged from their God. They're wondering what the purpose of this life is all about. There are people with no literal home. There are many more with no spiritual home. And there are millions with neither a spiritual or a physical home in this world. This fall, I'll be uh, going with a team of five people to India. Uh, 18 months ago, we sent out from our church Elizabeth Schrock, who is um, doing ministry in northern India. And um, we are going there to encourage her and her team. And as we're in northern India, this is a picture from where we're going to be. Beautiful country. Beautiful part of the country. This is where people from other parts of the country come to vacation. It's that beautiful. It's, it's very affluent. It's very beautiful. It's very pleasing to the eye. But there are people all over that city, like over 99% of them that have no spiritual home. And this picture is from the same city. There are also people that have no physical place to lay their home, to lay their head, no place to call home. So we're going there to encourage the people that are on the ground, demonstrating and declaring the gospel to those that live in India. If you are a Christian that lives in this part of the world, you don't have a ch church to choose from. You have so many churches to choose from right here in Johnson County on this road. Even if they want to follow Christ, they don't have a group of people to do it with. People looking for a home, people looking for a place to lay their head. Right here in Iowa City, at the University of Iowa, for the first time ever, at the IMU, the Student Union, they're having a food pantry. Because last year, they discovered there are students that are going to bed hungry, that are working their way to get through college, but they don't find anything to eat. So they're having a food pantry for them. We have people that are hungry in our own community. We see on the southeast side of Iowa City, we see people that have uh, transplanted here, many of them from Chicago, looking for a place to call home, looking for community. We see the nations coming to our doorstep. At the University of Iowa in the last four years, the number of international students has doubled in four years. There are international businesses popping up all over the downtown Iowa City area because the nations are coming to study at the University of Iowa. We literally have the nations coming to our door. Many of them are rich in monetary means, but they do not have a spiritual home. We partner with a ministry called Friends of International Students where you can adopt, invite an international student that's attending the university into your home once a month to give them a sense of home. You can actually sign up to do that today. Right as you exit the auditorium here, right on the right, you'll find Ryan Simpson, our college ministry director. You'll find Wade Summers from Friends of International Students. They would love to get you connected to that need. We do that to provide a spiritual home, to communicate, to declare, to demonstrate the gospel to the nations. We send out missionaries. We call them field staff as we send them out of our church. But they are a representation of Grace Community Church. God has called our entire church, every believer, to be a part of seeing that people find a physical and spiritual home on every part of this planet. That's what life is all about. So I ask again, where are we headed as, as a church? Why are we doing a series like this? Is the purpose of all of this to grow and be a bigger church that's doing it better than the next guy down the road? Is it to have more comfortable chairs in the service? Is it to grow numerically? Is it to be the biggest church in Johnson County? Is it to be a more biblical church so we'll preach verse by verse through the Bible? 
Is the purpose of your life just to be a better Christian that sins less or feels better about your spiritual life week after week as you come to each service? Or is it to bring glory to God by seeing his name proclaimed in every tribe, in every tongue, in every people group on the planet? That is God's purpose. Are we going to be a part of his purpose? That's my question for you this morning. Will we find purpose in the purposes of God or will we continue to try to make a name for ourselves? As individuals, as a church, as Western Christians, will we continue to try to make a name for ourselves? We feel this sense of longing. We feel this sense that does any of this matter? And I tell you that it doesn't unless it is about demonstrating and declaring the gospel to every nation, America included. But why don't we do this? If God has made us to live on mission, why don't we live on mission? Number one, we think this is our home. We think this is home. We think America is home. And if it is our home, we should continue to build bigger houses because we want a bigger house. If this is home, if this is what it's all about, we should continue to try to be as comfortable as possible. And we should go to the church that entertains and feeds us the most. We should make every decision based off of a feeling or what we want. We should continue to make a name for ourselves if this is our home. So we find ourselves doing all of those things because we think this is home. And it's not. We are citizens of heaven. We are God's redeemed people, God's holy nation, brought together for a purpose. It's not all about us. It's about his purposes. That's the second reason. We don't live on mission because we think life is all about us. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, we are told that we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God, God's special possession. Doesn't that make you feel good? We're God's chosen people. He saw us and he chose us and we're special and we're a holy nation claimed by him. But we put a period there. We think we should just feel good about ourselves. So we come each Sunday morning, each Sunday night to get a little bit of energy so we can keep going spiritually the rest of the week so we can make it back here again on Sunday because we think it's about us. We want our ear tickled. We want to make a name for ourselves. But in 1 Peter 2, there's not a period. It keeps saying more words that are important to us. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God, a peculiar, special, bought people to proclaim his excellence. That's what we're redeemed for, to proclaim his excellence. If if he wants you to be in heaven with him, he will snap his fingers and take you now because that's your home is to be with your God. And because of Christ's work on the cross on our behalf, we will be with him. We will be reunited with our creator someday. And when he's ready for you to be there, he will snap your fingers and take you home, whether it's now or in 80 years from now. But he has set the exact times and places where you should live. And if you have reached out and found God, then he has work for you to do. It's to proclaim his excellencies to the nations. This is all over scripture. God keeps telling his people, go fill the earth with the knowledge and the glory of God. And they keep coming together and trying to make a name for themselves. And he keeps sending them out. Either through proclamation or through his divine judgment, he keeps dispersing them. Because he wants to fill the earth with the knowledge and the glory of himself. We just read at the Tower of Babel, They came together and said that they wanted to make a name for themselves, that they wanted to be of one language, that they wanted to build one big city for their namesake. And it says that God dispersed them all over the world. 
That's his plan and his purpose is to disperse his believers all over the world, set the exact times and places where we live so that we would be his missionary, his ambassador. He has given us his ministry of reconciliation. He has reconciled us to himself to proclaim his mercies to the world. And he has put you right where you are to proclaim the gospel right where you are. There is no word for missionary in the Bible. There are two words, disciple and sent one. And every single believer is to be a disciple who is sent. And you know what a disciple does? He follows his savior. He follows the good shepherd. He follows Jesus. We're a Christian if we follow Jesus. And do you know what Jesus does? He demonstrated and declared the gospel everywhere he went. Not based on religious affiliation or what family they were born into or how good they were or how much money they had. Jesus demonstrated and declared the gospel to everyone and it was scandalous because everyone wanted to make a name for themselves. But Jesus came to make a name for the Father so that the Father would be glorified. And that is what he's calling you and I to do, to demonstrate and declare the gospel right where we are. So what do we do? What do we do in light of this? Number one, we believe the gospel day by day. We don't just know the gospel, but believe it. Really believe that we are redeemed people because of what Christ has done for us. Believing the gospel. Often we don't participate in God's work and what God is doing because we don't believe the good news for ourselves. We don't believe it's good news. When you have good news, you tell everyone. We don't believe that it's good news because we're not telling anyone. Believe the gospel day by day. Number two, participate in global gospel mission. If we are not praying for, paying for, and or going on God's gospel mission, we are disobedient. We are not following our chief shepherd, our senior pastor, our savior. We are not doing what he is doing if we are not praying that he would be glorified in every nation. It's not a niche group of our church that's going to do gospel mission to the nations. It's all of us. You may be a goer, you may be a sender, you may be a prayer, you may be a giver financially, but all of us are called to be on God's gospel mission. It's what he's called us to do. We cannot be called Christ's church. We cannot say he is our senior pastor if we do not do what he does and what he did when he walked on the earth. Third, demonstrate and declare the gospel right where you are. Elizabeth is in northern India, and we sent her as a church. She is sent there to be a missionary. And every day she wakes up remembering, I am not in my home. I'm from Iowa. I'm here to tell these people about Jesus. In the same way, you have been sent to work tomorrow. You have been sent home tomorrow to minister to your kids. You have been sent to school tomorrow as a missionary and you are to wake up tomorrow morning and to think, this is not my home. I am from heaven. I am God's sent one. And I have a message for the world. I am going to demonstrate and declare the gospel today as God's missionary right where I find myself. We are to fill this world with the knowledge and the glory of God. We are to tell all 16,000 people groups that live on this planet about their God. We are to fill the halls of every dorm. We are to fill the halls of every building at the University of Iowa. We are called to fill every cubicle 
In every workplace, every living room, in every home, every street, and every neighborhood with a knowledge of the glory of God. We're to fill our homes with the knowledge and the glory of God. This is what we are made to do. There is no other purpose to be found. This is living out the gospel. In Matthew 8, 20, we hear Jesus say to them, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus, who sat at the right hand of the Father, left his home so that we might have home. That's the gospel. That we could be united with our Savior, with our God, Not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ. Because of his payment for our sins. Because of what he has done for us, we have a message to this world that they can be reconciled to their God. Not by their good works, not by their religious participation, but because of the work of Jesus on the cross for them and for you and for me. In Revelation 5 that we looked at earlier, The angel says to John, who's looking in on this playing out of history, and he says, weep no more. The Lamb of God is worthy to open the scroll. What he's saying is the past, the current reality, and the future make no sense apart from the gospel. Apart from what Christ has done for us, nothing makes any sense. So if you find in your life that nothing makes sense, that you're afraid of the quiet because you don't want to think about what's the purpose of life, if you find yourselves in those moments, remember Christ. Remember the one who has been sent to save you. And remember that you are given that same message of being sent to be a minister of reconciliation. In Revelation 21, We read, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God gave himself to them and he will be with them as their God. The dwelling place of God with man. Perfect relationship with God. Perfect relationship with one another. The restoration of all things in the end. It's also called the marriage supper of the Lamb, where people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, every skin color, every socioeconomic status will come together to participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are going to take part in communion now. It's the breaking of bread, the drinking of juice, remembering Christ's body broken for us, Christ's blood spilt on our behalf, this is to remember what is to come. This is to remember what Christ has done in the past and remember that this is not our home. That one day, because of Christ, we will participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that marriage supper will include every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. It will be the most multi-ethnic, diverse meal you have ever been to. And it will be all about Jesus. The elements are coming around now. After the song is played, we will take them together. You feel unworthy to take part in this like I do? You feel like you have betrayed your Savior in so many ways like I do? Take heart. It's not based on your righteousness based on his goodness and his sacrifice on your behalf. So Paul goes on to say, he took bread, he gave thanks, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You can take the bread. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood spilled for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Father, for the work that you have done. God, we try to make a name for ourselves, but we are unworthy to call you our Savior. We are unworthy to make a name for ourselves. And in fact, we find ourselves wandering, acting as if we're hopeless, 
God, we are made for more than this. We are made for more than making a great name for ourselves. We want to live for your great name, to proclaim your excellencies to the ends of the earth. Would you stand with me? Close with a portion from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered from the lands, from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry, thirsty, their soul fainted within them. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Go in grace. We'll see you next week.